All right, you are on the big screen now. Can everyone hear my voice? Okay, right. now, can, you, can you hear my voice? All right, so let me introduce our special guest tonight. Uh, Dr. Bernard McGrain is a PhD from New York University. He's a professor of sociology at Chapman University, Orange, California. His principal fields of study have been sociology, philosophy, anthropology, and intellectual history. And he has poured his passions for writing and teaching into his works beyond anthropology, society, and the other, the UnTV and the 10 mile per hour car, experiments in personal freedom and everyday life. This book is not required, an emotional survival manual for students. I'm intrigued by that one. And watching television is not required. He is also featured in two educational videos, the ad and the id, sex, death, and subliminal advertising, and the ad and the ego, advertising and identity. He offers a wide variety of courses, social psychology, sociology of death and dying, sexual literacy and society, mass communications and society, advertising and society, honors, death, self, and society, honors, cosmology, self, and society, listen to all this, honors, social movement of the 60s. He also offers a meditation course, notably Ancient Wisdom and Modern Madness, Mind, Self, and Society in Tibetan Buddhism, a relatively inexpensive 10-day travel slash meditation course to a Tibetan American meditation center in the Colorado Rockies called Shambhala Mountain Center. Uh, you can learn more about them at chapman.edu in their faculty page under Bernard McGrain. I want to thank Science on Screen, the Coolidge Corner Theater, Alfred P. Sloan again, and our special guest for their collaboration and support of this event. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bernard McGrain. Let's hear it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And, and welcome to tonight's presentation, this film. Um, it is a spectacular film. So um, I want us all just to take a moment, if you will, and uh, you know, just give ourselves a moment to kind of wake up out of this kind of cinematic trance that most of us succumb to while we're engrossed in this film, you know, watching this film. So just take a moment, a breath or two. So the title of the, the talk I want to present tonight is called Uncertainty, where existence itself starts to fragment, sleeping, dreaming, dying, and watching a film. And I thought I'd like to begin with a, a quote from a, a review that was written in 1990 when the film first came out by a pretty prominent uh, film reviewer, Roger Ebert. Uh, just, uh, it captures, I think, a lot of the kind of emotional tone and flavor of the film. This movie left me reeling with turmoil and confusion with feelings of sadness and despair. Those are the notes it strives for. Jacob's Ladder enters into the hallucinations of a desperate mind and lives there. It evokes a paranoid, schizophrenic state as effectively as any film I have ever seen. Despite an ending that is intended as victorious, this movie is a thoroughly painful and depressing experience. I ordinarily am more than a little impatient with movies that deal with hallucinations, with dream states and delusions, because I feel artificially manipulated. You know, the filmmakers are jerking my chain. And, you know, it's just kind of lazy filmmaking in a certain way doing all that. But Jacob's Ladder is so well made, however, that I didn't feel impatient this time because I didn't have the opportunity. This movie lives right on the raw edge of insanity and carries us along with it. This is a film about no less than life and death. And Jacob seems to stand at a midpoint of a ladder that reaches in two directions, up to heaven, like the ladder that God put down for the biblical Jacob in Genesis, or down to hell in drug-induced hallucinations. 
this movie was not a pleasant experience. Not every movie needs to be fun. Um, this brought to mind when I read that uh, statement by William James, a famous kind of um, philosopher, American philosopher, psychologist, uh, and, th and this statement he put in his psychology book around the year 1900. Normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness, while all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. So tonight, I, I will not be directly addressing the content or structure of the film, but rather I wanna address the background philosophical teachings that inspired the screenwriter, his name is Bruce Joel Rubin, very directly. And the director, Adrian Lin, or Adrian Lin, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce him, uh, indirectly through working with Rubin. So most of my, and most of my remarks will be grounded in the context of my personal training in uh, the meditative mindfulness traditions of Tibetan Buddhism and in my university courses on death and dying, as well as my courses on the media, films. And I intend my remarks to be more evocative than declarative and more suggestive than assertive. Um, and I hope to you know, do this presentation roughly in about 20, 25 minutes, and then we can open it up for questions and answers. So um, as I mentioned in the title, there are, I think, some deep family resemblances within the spheres of sleeping, of dreaming, of dying, and watching a film, cinematic experience, of our relationship with sleeping, our relationship with dreaming, our relationship with death, with dying, and with our experience of watching a film. Now, I, I know these sound uh, far, far afield. <laughs> I know that. And unrelated one to another. But consider, just on a cultural, etymological, word associative level, Sleeping and dying, or sleep and death, are in fact brothers in terms of our uh, origins of our culture, of Western culture and ancient classical Greek uh, culture. The ancient Greek demigod Morpheus, god of sleep, is brother to Thanatos, uh, the god of death. So I want to deal first with sleep, with sleeping. In the Tibetan meditative traditions, practicing with sleeping, meditation practice with sleeping, your relationship with sleeping, and practicing a meditative practice with dreaming, your relationship with dreaming, are seen as very good preparations, uh, familiarizations, and rehearsals for working with death and dying. When you go to sleep, all of a sudden you're not there. And in one of the many international conferences entitled Western Scientists Meet with the Dalai Lama, a scientist said to the Dalai Lama, you know, while falling asleep, normal human beings simply black out. And to this, the Dalai Lama responded, it's true. Going through this transition without blacking out is one of the highest accomplishments for a yogi. So in dreamless sleep, there is no experience of experience. And there is no experience of having no experience. There is no experience of boundarylessness. And in terms of actual meditation practice, it's uh, the dream yoga. It's easier to recognize a dream as a dream than to recognize dreamless sleep as dreamless sleep. And in the Tibetan tradition, these practices are more formally known as sleep yoga, dream yoga, and bardo yoga. I'll talk about more about bardo later. It's, uh, uh, it basically means in between, and it's very much associated with the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the bardo traditions 
that the um, screenwriter uh, was immersed in and studied. So in that, in that tradition, sleep is in essence a kind of rehearsal process of dying. So every night is kind of a, a pop quiz for uh, the final exam of death. <laughs> you can put it that way. And on the level of personal psychology, when I go to sleep, I relinquish my consciousness, my conscious hold on the world. I release and surrender to unconsciousness. I, I am, as it were, liberated from the burden of being a conscious being, self-reflectively conscious being. And as many modern existentialist authors have addressed, Dostoevsky comes most prominently to mind, uh, our human workaday rational consciousness is in its very texture, burdensome, heavy to be with. In my death class, I do a, like a class experiment with them, a thought experiment, because the students are always, you know, complaining about not having enough, uh, not having enough time and being overworked and all stressed out and they need more time. And I give them a little thought experiment where I say, I have this magical pill, which I'm glad, I'll be happy to give to you, be free, no charge. There's no side effects from it. And after you take it, you will be wide awake. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. You will be wide awake. You will never, ever, ever fall asleep again. No sleep, no surrender to unconsciousness. Usually when they connect with that, they say, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth, who you know, sleepless, sleeplessness it is a torture to the soul. So to let yourself sink into sleep, you have to let go. Letting go is a big part of the Tibetan tradition training of what meditation is all about. You have to let go of your personal idea of yourself and dissolve into a kind of primal something or other. Losing the everyday self the willingness to lose our sense of self that allows us to sink into sleep can also give us guidance and wisdom with the actual experience of dying. That's one of Jacob's uh, lessons here. Um, to quote the Dalai Lama, the, experience, the experiences you have while falling asleep and while dying result from the dissolution of various elements changes in various vital energies. And in the West, we often see, you know, the sleep frees us from suffering. I mean, consider when someone we love is in great or unbearable amount of physical and perhaps mental pain, especially in terms of dying, uh, we're somewhat relieved when they fall asleep. Uh, same thing with children. I mean, all, everyone has had parents in here, you know, wailing infant, when they fall asleep, they're so much more peaceful. And even when we regard death after a long illness, a long suffering, we say they are finally freed from suffering. Because there's kind of a belief in the West that death frees us from suffering. And that's very different from the Tibetan tradition. Death, dying. Um, probably uh, the paradigmatic statement in terms of the Western view of dying and death comes from Woody Allen, a great nihilist filmmaker. And he put it in a sentence, it's amazing. I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. You know, and that's sort of very, still very much, you know, I, want, I, I don't want to die consciously with awareness. I want to, I want to just, just not be there when it happens. I want to die peacefully in my sleep. And um, one of the, uh, I want to quote a, a statement from uh, Bruce Joel Rubin, the writer of this. Uh, he traveled around the world when he was a young man looking for sort of spiritual guidance and training and wound up in Tibet for quite a while and studied the Tibetan Book of the Dead. The actual title for that is The Liberation Through Hearing During the Intermediate State, okay, the Bardo State, the Intermediate State. And Rubin said, uh, the inspiration for his writing of films, in a sense, is my entire spiritual upbringing. Once you have a meditative life, you start to see that the world is really far different than what it appears to be. What appears to be finite 
is really couched in the infinite and the infinite imbues everything in our lives. Um, and so that's kind of the flavor, I think, uh, in the background of the composition of the film. Um, another uh, dimension that came out of my, uh, while watching this film for me, was a, a quote from uh, a Raymond Moody, who probably about 30 years ago wrote a book about life after death or life after life. I forget the exact title. And, and he's a scientist. He was a, um, a, a, psych, a psychiatrist. And what he did was interview dozens and dozens and dozens of people about their experience uh, when they had a near-death experience. And one of his people said this. It reminded me immensely of the film. And this is a quote from someone. I thought I was dead. And I wasn't sorry that I was dead, but I just couldn't figure out where I was supposed to go. My God, I'm dead. I can't believe it. Because you never really believe, I don't think, fully that you're going to die. It's always something that's going to happen to the other person. And although you know, you know it, <clears throat> you never really believe it. Hence the Tibetan emphasis on so much practicing about mortality, my own death and dying. So as I mentioned, the, the word bardo literally means between two or the in-between. And I want to um, quote a couple of mm, passages on a commentary to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. This is from my teacher, uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, was one of the early Tibetan lamas to come to the United States, learn English and, and, and teach Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, he helped the early translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and he wrote a commentary for it. And uh, see if you could hear some pretty deep associations with the, you know, the, the philosophy and background structure of the film. The first basic bardo experience, he says, is the experience of uncertainty about whether one is actually going to die in the sense of losing contact with the solid world or whether one could continue go on living, going on living. I mean, even on a mundane level, when you get really sick or have a terrible accident and, you know, or, you know, it's a kind of feels the life and death thing, you're not certain. Are you going to make it or not? There's this, you know, inevitable uncertainty in that first kind of bardo in approaching death. This uncertainty it, see, is seen in terms of losing one's ground, the possibility of stepping out from the real world into an unreal world, a strange hallucinogenic kind of world. And then uh, a little later in the commentary, a similar kind of flavor is being addressed to people who work with people who are dying or, uh, you know, are along the, you know, at, at the bedside of people who are dying. Uh, he begins this by talking a little bit about how this is in Tibet. It seems that in the Tibetan culture, people do not find death a particularly irritating or difficult situation. But here in the West, we often find it extremely difficult to relate to it. Nobody tells us the final truth. It's such a terrible rejection, a fundamental rejection of love that nobody is really willing to help a dying person's state of mind. And helping the state of mind is a very central um, teaching in all this. It seems unnecessary, it, I'm sorry, it seems necessary that he should be told he is dying. He or she, the dying person, should be told they are dying. It may be difficult to actually take such a step, but if one is a friend or a husband or a wife or, you know, some sort of loving relationship, uh, commu this really communicates trust to that person in that situation. At last, somebody really cares about you. Somebody is not playing a game of hypocrisy, is not going to tell you a lie in order to please you. It'll be okay. There's nothing. You'll be fine. Actually, relating with the dying person is very important, telling him that death is not a myth at this point. 
but that it has actually, it is actually happening. But we are your friends, therefore we are watching your death. We're alongside of you in your death. We know that you are dying and you know that you are dying. We're re really meeting one another at this point. That is the finest and best demonstration of friendship and communication. And it's almost actually a formal a ritual prayer that the Tibetans say. And this is a quote from the prayer. <laughs> you are dying. You are leaving your friends and family. Your favorite surroundings will no longer be there. You are going to leave us. But at the same time, there is something which continues. There is the continuity of your positive relationship with all your beloveds. When you die, you will have all sorts of traumatic experiences of leaving the body, as well as your old memories coming back to you as, halluc as hallucinations. Whatever the visions and hallucinations may be, just relate to what is happening rather than trying to run away. And the advice in terms of working with someone who's dying, saying the whole point is that when you instruct a dying person, you're really talking to yourself. Your stability is part of the dying person. So if you are stable, then automatically the person in the bardo state, this in-between state, will be attracted to that. So in that sense, you know, the experience of death is all about fear and uncertainty and bewilderment and groundlessness. And having just read that quote from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, I, remember Louis's statement to Jake while he was doing the chiropractic adjustment to him on the table? He sort of quotes Meister Eckhart, the Western mystic. If you're frightened of dying, and you're holding on, you'll see devils tearing your life away. But if you've made peace, the devils are really angels freeing you from the earth. It's just a matter of how you look at it. That's all. So, dreaming. How do you meditate while you're dreaming? <laughs> okay. Um, most of us in the West, we now know about mindfulness meditation practice, and we do it in a normal wake-a-day, you know, life. And the essence of it, in some sense, is just <clears throat> reconnecting with the basic simplicity and sanity of your being here with reality, with your mind. And as you do that, you realize your mind's sort of very distracted, and it's all over the place. And you think this, and you think that, and it's very jumpy. And you use your breath as kind of a, a, an anchor. And you notice when you're drifting away or lost in thought, you kind of acknowledge that and you come back to the breath. The breath keeps you as a stabilizing element in terms of all these uh, sort of monkey mind thoughts that happen. Or you come back to the physical sensations in your body. What do you do while you're dreaming? or in, in dreamless sleep? How do you practice mindfulness there when we don't have our breath and our senses to come back in, okay? Because uh, in, in the dream state and in the dying and death state, we don't have our senses to come back to. <coughs> in that state, within this tradition, <coughs> excuse me, a thought becomes a reality. The thought, say, of London pops up, and suddenly you're in London. Okay, and the dream mindscape becomes landscape. Why don't we recognize the dream while we are dreaming? This is quality about the dream. The dream holds of the mind in a vice-like grip, with no possibility of mind wandering. Okay, and the the dream is and the dream is always present. It's always now. You know, not as in everyday life when we're interacting with people or doing something, we sometimes think of the past or the future. That does not occur within the dream state. It's, it, it's intensely now. And during a dream, there is nothing dream, during a dream, there is nothing dreamlike about it. It is reality. Dreams don't seem like dreams. 
Dreams have the power to erase everything from your mind but themselves. And I kind of want to associate that with the experience of watching a film as well. We'll do more about that in a little bit. Uh, Stephen LeBurge, a great Western scientist, one of the founders of the Sleep and Lucid Dreaming Lab up at Stanford University, uh, worked with a lot of people in terms of helping them with lucid dreaming. Um, the, you know, the Tibetan tradition has lucid dreaming, but they push it into another notch into dream yoga, where the meditation practice happens inside the dream. But uh, this was one of LeBurge's common experience when he worked with people um, as they learned how to uh, recognize that they were dreaming while they were dreaming. Novice lucid dreamers, LeBurge says, often wake up the moment they become lucid. And it's very common, people that try and work on this. Oh, I'm in a dream, and they wake up. Most people are astonished to discover that they are dreaming. This astonishment stems from the realization they have been fooling themselves in a colossal way. Okay? Fooling themselves in a colossal way. It is definitely a surprise to learn that your normally trustworthy senses are reporting you an absolutely flawless portrayal of a world that doesn't exist outside the dream. Now, finally, watching a film. I want to address the psychology of film watching inside the context of the psychology of dreaming that I've kind of been highlighting, highlighting here. And just a few short comments. Uh, uh, I've mostly been very impressed with a book by Colin McGinnis, a philosopher, Western philosopher. And his book is entitled The Power of Movies, how a screen and mind interact. And the premise of the whole book is uh, the astonishing universality and mass appeal of 20th century cinema, the classic experience of 20th century cinema, going into a movie theater, or in your case, a drive-in theater, and with a big screen and watching a movie. It's uh, in it's a bit, you know, it is, it is, it is, it happens in countries all over the world, all different kinds of culture. It's extremely, uh, and what's going on with that? Okay. Why does it have such more, more power than any other art form that humans are uh, aware of or engaged in? It has this amazing, great mass appeal all across the world. And McGinn's answer to why this is so powerful and why it so universally has such appeal, because all across the world, people dream innately. You know, unlike reading and writing, we don't need to learn how to watch a motion picture, a cinema film. Movies carry some sort of psychic charge, if you will, that no other art form can quite match. The sheer intensity, the sense of entrancement. You know, we're gripped sitting in a dark cave-like space, not unlike the inside of your head when your eyes are shut. The movie watching experience, in the movie watching experience, we enter an altered state of consciousness, which is in, uh, enthralling and irresistible. Oliver Sacks, as a neurologist, made the comment, we may find movies convincing you know, and overwhelming precisely because we ourselves break up time and reality much as a movie camera and editing does into discrete frames, which we then reassemble into an apparently continuous flow. So how do movies work on the mind? What, what is it about the mind that prepares it for the influence of movies? And I'm sure you, we all participate in that or you wouldn't be here tonight. Movies work most powerfully and magically on the mind because they make subliminal contact with the unconscious mind because they are of the same order as the dream, having the same structure engendering a similar experience. And uh, I want to sort of 
bring this to a conclusion with a quote from um, someone very much immersed in the, uh, in the film world. I believe he was a director, but also a film critic. Uh, this is a quote that, that's in um, uh, Colin McGinn's book. Uh, the gentleman's name is Walter Murch, and he is addressing what Adrian Lyne is, you know, an astonishing, accomplished, a master artist of, is the, the cuts and the editing and the rearrangement of, a, of images, and films, and soundtracks. And all that is really strange in a lot of ways. So this is Walter Murch's reflections on edits and cuts. At the instant of the cut, there is a total and instantaneous discontinuity in the field of vision. It is all the more amazing because the instantaneous displacement achieved by the cut is not anything we experience in ordinary life. So why do cuts work? Do they have some hidden foundation in our own experience? Or are they the invention, an invention that suits the convenience of filmmakers? and people who have just somehow uh, become used to them. You know, we learned it like we just kind of picked this up and learned it. Well, although day-to-day -day reality appears to be continuous, there is that other world in which we spend perhaps a third of our lives, the night-to-night -night reality of dreams. And the images and dreams are much more fragmented uh, intersecting in much stranger and more abrupt ways than the images of waking reality. Ways that approximate at least the interaction produced by cutting, editing. Perhaps the explanation is as simple as that. We accept the cut because it resembles the way images are juxtaposed in our dreams. In fact, the abruptness of the cut may be one of the key determinants in actually producing the similarity between dreams and films. In the darkness of the theater, we say to ourselves, in effect, this looks like reality, but it cannot be reality because it is so visually discontinuous. Therefore, it must be a dream. So to conclude, <laughs> films put the mind in the same kind of state, state of mind that dreams do. So thank you. We can uh, perhaps have a Q and A. Wonderful. Everyone, uh, please join me in thanking the doctor with a round of, uh, of honking for me. Can everyone <laughs> hear me? All right, thank you. So again, folks, if anyone in your cars has any questions, uh, visit thefreedacinema.org forward slash ask, A-S-K, thefreedacinema.org slash ask. I will get your question and I will relate it to the doctor. I have a question um, when, and, and it's interesting too, because the first film we did in the series was Eraserhead. And ah. we presented it with uh, Dr. Amir Raz, also from Chapman. And the Tibetan Book of the Dead and dreams found their way into that conversation quite a lot too. Uh, yeah, I have a question about, in this film in particular, mm. one of the things that I've always oscillated on and that I don't think is ever really said outright, but maybe if, if we're looking at the book as a resource, you might have an answer to this. There's a, an implication in the film that the Danny Aiello character, his, his yes. friend, the doctor, is trying to help him come to terms with his death and trying to lead him to heaven. And Jesse, very wonderfully named character, is, <laughs> is trying to make him hold on to carnality uh, in, in, as far as how I see it, and hold on to the flesh. Hold My on. question is, with the, if we're using the book as a reference, with the, are these characters and all the, are these archetypal characters entities in his bardo state that are trying to lead him in one direction or the other or are they fragments of his own psyche and his own awareness of his death that are trying to communicate to his id or, or for the lack of a better way of putting it um 
I think in terms of my understanding of the Tibetan tradition, I would say yes. <laughs> Got it. To both, you, you know, yes, there, there is an entity-like quality to it because we are, uh, the very nature of our being is projection out to palpable reality. And yes, it is a dimension of our own mind because we don't access anything outside our own mind on, on a very ultimate level. And the, the moment of death is so central in terms of the Tibetan tradition and, uh, and the, the Bardo Thirtle, the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead, because most of the, um, you know, workaday, um, palpable Newtonian mechanics of reality are gone. No. So the, the, the mind dimension is a lot more heightened. And in that sense, it's a very dangerous time because what you think becomes somehow real. You know, that, the idea of mindscape beco becoming landscape. And um, so the, uh, the teaching, the aspiration for the teaching is to be stable uh, and not to push away demons or grab at, you know, carnality or, or, or wonderfulness or anything like that. It, you know, it's neither repelling nor grasping, but just to allowing it to be. And it's interesting because this has always been one of my favorite films. And the closest thing that I've seen is it, a very interesting film to find it in that sort of communicates that duality is, uh, I think, at the end of the last Harry Potter film of all films, when wow. Harry is visited uh, by, the, uh, you know, the ghost, for the lack of a better way of putting it, of, of Dumbledore. And he asks him, are you really here or is this my imagination? And yes. I forget exactly what Dumbledore says, but he implies the same. Why can't the two be simultaneously? Wouldn't the two be simultaneously true? That's that's fantastic. And, and you know, we just watched the film tonight, and it is projected. It's somehow outside of me, but it's not. You know, it all took place in my my, my connecting with it. Correct. And, and one of the things is very hard is to actually disconnect from the immersion in the film narrative world and see it clip, 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 soundtrack, you know, to begin to um, see the underlying mechanics of the whole thing. Sure. And, and appreciate, appreciate both. And it's a film very much like, I, I would say, Mulholland Drive or any other film that sort of reveals itself at the end that rewards repeated viewings in the sense oh, yeah. of, you know, the, the woman on the staircase who tells him flat out, you're dead. According to your lifeline, you are already dead. Right, right, right. You know, yeah, he gets that message throughout. Once you get a sense of this, you yeah. see the film, you see so many things say, you know, you're dead or you're not dying. You're not dying. You're right. dead. You're not dying. And the voices, the, you know, and they're all over the place. You know, and a lot they, of cuts to, to suggest that what he's experienced is being brought back by the, you know, in Vietnam, you know, when he has this, yeah. uh, this shocking moment and he's in ice and everything, and they're cutting to a, what, what's, what's presented as a flashback of them trying to resuscitate him, but that's literally what's happening as he's experiencing these feelings of dropping cold and then suddenly not being yes. cold anymore. Yes. It's, it's just right. so fantastically done. Um, right, and there's a level, because literally he's, well, literally in, a, in, in the context of the film, it's a right. literal, you know, the structure, which, you know, it's, it's such a labyrinth. That's why it, it, you know, it's so effective in that way. I'm wondering if you've seen a film called Enter the Void uh, by Gaspar Noé. I haven't seen that yet. It's been, rec I think maybe you recommended it to me. I think, yes, I definitely want to see it. I mean, the only thing over. I associated with this was, was Sixth Sense. I re-looked at that, you know, and they're somewhat similar I think, in there, but. Uh, no, I, I, I will definitely look at that. That one actually I, goes out of its way to reference the Tibetan Book of the Dead quite a bit, but it's a very similar sort of narrative in, in what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any questions, Mr. Jeb? Okay. Folks, once again, if you have a question, it's thefreedacinema.org slash ask. Thefreedacinema.org slash ask. I appreciated the insight about the screenwriter, so I did not know that the screenwriter had actually gone yeah. and studied the Book of the Dead. Yes. 
he studied with a number of different spiritual traditions and seemed to connect most deeply in Tibet with the Tibetan, you know, tradition of meditative mindfulness. And in particular, within the whole Tibetan, you know, um, universe of meditative practices, the bardo practices are seen as, you know, very um, advanced and uh, powerful, but they have their own sort of tradition. And there are actual, actual, um, you know, for serious practitioners, um, bardo retreats where they go into complete darkness, you know, in a little hut uh, without sound, without, you know, any sort of sensory input, and uh, just try and be with that for, I, I think it's something like 40 days. And um, that kind of absence of sensory stimulation, you begin to get a, a more vivid in experience of the dimensions of your own mind coming forth, you know, projecting right. out. I'm wondering, you know, the, I mentioned earlier, the film obviously has a lot of outright symbolism, you know, archetypal symbolism. Is there anything else specifically to the narrative of the film or any specific shots, characters, lines, references that you identify as being right out of this philosophy? In a, in, in a Adrian Line filtered sort of uh, oh, <laughs> reframe? Not, not particularly. Uh, one of the dimensions that came out, I was going to include it, but I didn't want to, you know, this thing was getting over, over the 25, 30 minutes. Um, the reference to <clears throat> hallucinogens, because that plays a pretty big part in the film. And in our culture, the introduction to psychedelics and hallucinogens was really kind of one of the catalysts for the beginning, early phases of looking at the Tibetan Book of the Dead to see the, um, uh, the workaday consciousness vanish and the fear of insanity and uh, nightmare realities happening and the loss of groundedness happening on a psychedelic thing and how to manage all that without panicking, without freaking out, you know, uh, without abusing it in certain ways. Um, and that those um, and those uh, substances were known in the in the East for you know many centuries, and they were, you know, it was like I think one teacher told Ram Dass once. He says it's interesting. This will allow you to to um, to visit God, but you can't stay there. You have to come back. So we right. we think that this is a more um, you know a grounding approach to. Um, the night dimension of our lives, you know, uh, there's the day and the night, there's the life and death, and um, yeah, like that. Well, I just want to say again, and, and for those of you I asked earlier who, who tried to make it out the first time, we had some technical difficulties. Thank you for hanging in there with us. Thank sure. you for the second time. Um, you know, I, I really do want to acknowledge science on screen the yeah. Coolidge Corner Theater, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, um, you know, these opportunities for, for contextualizing cinema mm -hmm. and what could be taken from cinema to form mm -hmm. a deeper understanding. Um, you know, I relish these opportunities and, I, and I'm grateful for grants like Science on Screen to encourage mm -hmm. these sorts of dialogues and, and to make them possible. And also to individuals like yourself who, um, you were very, very quick to, to jump on this concept and to embrace it and to say, this sounds great. And, and you were familiar with the film. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. And especially right thank now, you. this last year has been rough. And, you know, education and cultural enrichment uh, took a huge, huge hit. And, you know, we have been grateful. I want to thank everyone that's here. You know, the drive-ins were our way of keeping our mission going. So give yourselves a round of applause. And um, and science on screen. Thank you for for giving a thumbs up to a drive-in version of what you usually do theatrically. Um, you know, a, a lot of things got put on hold, but I'm so glad that uh, because of, of 
groups like Python Screen and an individual like you, education and cultural vision didn't have to be uh, two of those things. So That's That's it's great. late. Thank you so, so very much. Um, Thank you, Logan, for all your efforts in terms of making this a reality for so many months. I greatly appreciate it. And you've also Thank given you. me a, a new way of looking at cinema, too, because I, I, it's interesting. When you rolled film and film watching into Sleeping and Death, it, and if, by the way, if there's any books, you mentioned one that you recommend to sort of further that for me and anyone that's interested, that conversation about film as almost uh, a waking dream. And yes, the Co uh, that, that's the most p profound philosophical treatment of cinema I have come across. I mean, I've always known, like, I, as soon as the, the, the curtain goes up and the, the film, I mean, I, I've I'm not in the lobby anymore. My past life is all gone. I'm not worried about, I'm completely there. It, you know, it has amazing power, unlike any other art form, more powerful, you know? And then it has a, the whole emotional flavor to it by the sound score that provides you what the emotions to people. Dreams are very, very similar. And he says, that is the key that we can act, that, that uh, makes, um, sensible why it's so universally why it appeals to everyone why, and why it has such psychic power in terms of grasping our attention and affects us emotionally deeply on so many levels well that is a great note to end on so thank you thank you so much once more everyone please for dr mcgrain thank you thank you for staying up late with us <laughs> have a very good night Thank you. Good Take night. Care. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please drive carefully. Please exit Thanks. carefully and um, have a good night. Thank you.